The single most important contribution APWA makes is the sharing of information, solutions, and perspectives on issues facing public works today. When we engage in conversation, we gain cognizance, making us stronger together. In February 2021, an extreme weather event took place throughout the state of Texas, resulting in widespread, unexpected public works infrastructure challenges. Joining us today, a panel of industry experts here to discuss community resiliency and its challenges as a result of natural disasters. Our experts will share lessons learned and considerations communities should explore when developing response plans, as well as steps public works professionals can take to ensure they are ready and prepared for the unexpected. Leading today's discussion of industry experts, Jan Winter, Senior Project Manager, Matrix Group. Welcome to our general session, Community Resiliency Preparedness and Natural Disaster Response. Try saying that a few times. I am Jen Winter and I will be your moderator for this session. This topic is important to me as it is to all of our panelists and I'm sure so many of you in the audience. It's hard to be in this profession without experiencing a natural disaster, a man-made incident, or having to deal with some sort of large-scale event. I'm excited about our session today. I hope you are too. We'll be start the session by a short introduction from all of our panelists, followed by a Q&A session. We hope today that you will gain some insight and some opportunities to continue the conversation in your own communities. Why is this topic so important to me and so relevant? Well, I'm currently a senior manager for Matrix Consulting Group, helping public agencies across the country. My prior job was uh, a public works director of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Many of you may think that not a lot happens in the state of Iowa, but I would strongly disagree with you. In the span of my time there, in the last 12 years, the city of Cedar Rapids alone has experienced three major federally declared disasters, including two floods and a derecho. What is a derecho, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked, because until August of 2020, I had no idea what a derecho was. Um, it is an er inland hurricane that we experience in the city of Cedar Rapids. The map shows you the slide of the winds. Uh, we had over 140 mile an hour sustained winds throughout the entire city in much of the state. And the most important part of this is it came with no warning. This was supposed to be a typical thunderstorm like you see in Iowa every August and across the Midwest, typical to what we saw here in St. Louis just yesterday. But this ended up being a very devastating storm for our entire community. The storm caused straight line winds between 90 and 140 miles an hour that lasted for almost 45 minutes. It had extensive damage, major structural damage, roads blocked, gas lines exposed, exposed and almost 350,000 people without power for weeks. As I mentioned, the storm was not expected, it wasn't planned, we didn't prepare for it. And while the impacts of the hurricane are devastating, we've seen the, the bucket trucks and the help lined up waiting to help. We had none of that because nobody could tell us that this was coming. This is a picture of what almost all of our streets in the community looked like. We had power lines down, trees down, trees wrapped in power lines. Cars buried, virtually all of our streets were impassable. No traffic signals were working and about 90% of our signage had been blown away. And in all this destruction, what we learned, as we've learned in all of these disasters, is that Public Works really is a community. And with the help of our state DOT and so many of our municipal partners across the state, we were able to respond very quickly. We had people coming in from all over the state and other parts of the country to try to help us as fast as they could. What we were also fortunately prepared for, because we'd been through this before, in 2008, we had a major flood of the Cedar River, which goes through the heart of our entire city. The river eventually crested at 31 feet, which is 19 feet above flood level. It left about 15 feet of water throughout our entire downtown. But we did learn from this event as we learned from all of our events. 
And fortunately, we did learn and we were planning and we were preparing because in 2016, the river would flood again. It was predicted to be almost 25 feet and we had four days to prepare, to prepare for what would be the city's second highest recorded river elevation. In that time, we constructed almost nine miles of HESCO barriers, along with earthen berms and levees, and we, we were fortunately successful in, in protecting the city from yet another devastating flood. Most importantly was the vision that the people of the city and the leadership had in setting us up. We had a flood control plan in place Portions of that had already been constructed, and just that small increase in resiliency was what allowed us to be able to prepare for that storm and protect the city. The city is currently building a permanent flood control system that includes seven and a half miles of walls, levees, and gates that will protect the entire downtown area to the 500-year flood elevation. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first panelist, Rick Foss who is a professor of engineering at the University of Iowa, a former public works director, and also one of your top 10, one of your previous top 10 award winners. Well, thank you, Jen. Uh, as Jen mentioned, I, I spent the majority of my career in public works, specifically for the city of Iowa City, and I also had the good fortune of, of uh, being named one of the top 10 leaders in 2018. And that is due in large part to the staff that I have in Iowa City. I really appreciate that. And, and we all know in our field that you, you cannot excel without a strong staff behind you. And I'll say the same is true in emergency response as well. Uh, oh, there's a, there's a shot of my staff there uh, and, and an outline of my experience. Now, I will say that while I was with the, the city of Iowa City, uh, trouble seemed to follow me. So in, in my 31 years there, I experienced the four largest floods of record just in a period of 21 years and led the response to those. And when it wasn't raining, it wasn't raining. We had severe droughts in 20, uh, 2011, excuse me, 2013, as well as 1988. The interesting thing in 2013 is it was so severe that it impacted our wastewater, that there was not enough flow in our system when the inf infiltration and inflow was removed, coupled with low flow fixtures, the solids were not moving through the system. So we began to have problems with hydrogen sulfide and methane production. So when you get in a drought now with low flow fixtures, keep an eye on your collection system. The other thing I'll point out about that drought in 2013, it's, it was sandwiched between two of our largest floods of record, that is the one in 2013 and 2014. So, you know, what's going on with our weather? It, it's like a car spinning back and forth. Uh, we've also had windstorms in Iowa City. In 2006, we had a tornado, and uh, we've also experienced a derecho that was more significant in, in our area. Uh, in 1998, that's uh, called the Corn Belt Derecho. At least that's what they call it on Wikipedia. And in addition to all that, uh, we had an enormous fire at our landfill. And as disasters go, I've got to tell you, that was the most difficult. It was most technically challenging, it was the most dangerous, and the most stressful to deal with. And you'll see in the pictures there, that it's public works staff, public works equipment that is dealing with this. This is beyond the scope of something that our fire department is going to deal with. So in 2014, I decided I was enough bad luck for Iowa City, it's time for me to retire. And uh, when I did, the local newspaper dubbed me a master of disaster. So that's not a title that we typically aspire to, but you know, it could be worse, so I'll take it. And I moved on to uh, teach at the University of Iowa. I'm now in my seventh year and I teach a variety of classes. Uh, my favorite class to teach is one on resilient infrastructure and emergency response. And in that class, I use a modified version of the emergency management continuum to teach our students how to design for resilience. What is resilience? What does it mean to design for resilience? When is it appropriate to do so and not do so? You don't need to design that into every project. We spend a, a lot of time focused on design. Then we uh, train them how to, for preparedness, uh, di writing different plans, emergency response plan, uh, debris management, evacuation, that sort of thing. And then we talk about their role in response, and a part of that role is understanding the NIM system, the National Incident Management System. 
and then we talk about the, the magic that occurs during recovery and mitigation, the, the opportunities that are there when you're rebuilding. So in a sense, I, I'm still mitigating today, but taking a different tact in that I'm, I'm helping to shape the next generation of engineers to go out and design projects differently. So back to you, Jen. Thank you. Our second panelist today is Elia Twig. She's a currently a senior manager with Consular Engineers and also a previous Public Works Director. Thank you, Jen. Um, yeah, so as she, she was saying, I've worked in the pri private sector and I currently work in the, I'm sorry, currently work in the pri private sector and I also worked in the public sector. I was uh, in the city of Palm Bay in Florida for 10 years and the last three and a half years I was the public works director. And currently in my role at Consor uh, Engineers, we also have actually uh, disaster preparedness as well. We work for the Florida Department of Transportation. We have a few contracts in the South Florida area where we actually, our main goal is to make sure that they get their maximum reimbursement for their events. And uh, in that, it's that disaster uh, recovery where we are the ones monitoring their debris and actually uh, watching the contractors do their work and doing all the documentation and, and the photos. And then uh, we also provide the reports to the DOT so that they can get their maximum reimbursement with uh, whether it's Federal Highway or, or with, through FEMA. But as my role in uh, the Public Works Department, when I used to work for the city of Palm Bay, I was operations manager during the 2008 Mother's Day fires. So as Rick had, you know, this fire, this is something that Public Works is not prepared to respond to, but we did uh, ultimately respond to these Mother's Day fires. And ironically, I had just had my first baby, so I was enjoying my Mother's Day and uh, coming back from my maternity leave to these Mother's Day fires. So it was a big uh, transition for me going from that mother's uh, being the first time mother to now having to uh, result to this, to this uh, disaster that we had in our city. Uh, there were fires due to arson, but during that time, Florida was a really dry, it was really dry. There was not a whole lot of rain, so there were actually fires throughout the state. And during this time, uh, people thought, you know, that it was probably due to that, but then we did find out that it was due to arson. So we had three days of these fires. There were 33 homes that were lost and uh, almost 2,100 uh, properties that were exposed. But uh, really, it was a big uh, deal in Palm Bay. We have a lot of uh, foresty areas in Palm Bay. It's pretty rural in the sense that there's just a lot of woods and then the homes uh, that are near these woods. So there was a lot of homes that were impacted and potentially impacted, but the best thing we could say is that there were no lives lost during that. Uh, but for, as far as public works crews, we were there. We had eight front end loaders that responded to the fire department. Uh, they requested our assistance to clear the lines uh, for them so that they can bring in their equipment and their uh, fire trucks into the woods, get closer to the fire. We also had uh, the uh, fleet management that we also had our fleet mechanics responding to these uh, guys uh, out in the field, whether it was repairing trucks out during the site, uh, like at, actually on site, or repairing them out back in the shop. But we still had our fleet management that was also taking care of uh, these fire trucks. Uh, so these are just some pictures of Public Works in action. Uh, there's a video out there if you're ever interested in seeing it. Uh, the Palm Bay did the off the cuff, so it was kind of like a play on words for uh, handcuffs, but uh, our police department had a public information officer and they used to do these videos. So there are some videos out there regarding this uh, public, or really the Mother's Day fires, but Public Works is shown in that video because they recognized us as being part of their emergency management to this event. But you can see in this picture here, the top left picture, there's actually a water truck there that was Public Works water truck, so we were there helping fight the fires. And the disadvantage that we had was we didn't have the fire gear like the firemen had, so that was a real struggle for us. Uh, as then another event that just happened a few months later, and again, ironically, during the uh, APWA Expo that was taking place in New Orleans. So our Public Works Director and our Assistant Public Works Director were actually at 
uh, that conference in New Orleans. So I was the third person in line as the operations manager and I was left in charge when they were gone and th this tropical storm was coming our way. So I kept telling our public works director, you know, it's just a tropical storm, we'll be fine, don't worry about it, you don't need to come back. Uh, it made landfall actually in four places in Florida. Uh, we had the Florida Keys was the first part, and then it cut across into Naples and just cut right across the state over to where I am, over into the Palm Bay or Brevard County area, touched into the Atlantic, came back over into New Smyrna Beach, went across the state again, went into the Gulf, and then ultimately in Panama City. So it really did touch a lot of Florida, basically the entire state, and then it went on to, uh, to a few other states. Uh, but it really was the most prolific tropical cyclone uh, event with all these tornadoes. There are 81 tornadoes within these five states. $560 million uh, in estimated damages. So it really uh, did a lot of damage. And here I was telling my public works director, oh, don't worry, uh, we got it handled. I can take care of this. Estimated three to five inches of, of rain. Well, we actually got 27.65 inches. That was the highest that we had. And that was where you see the star. That's actually where Palm Bay is. So that's where we had the most rain, and over the course of three days, we had that much rain. But the one thing I could say is I really, uh, as I was operations manager, I just hated our drainage system. It was just uh, kind of cumbersome looking. You had the swales in the front of the properties, then you had the ditches, and then they would connect to the canals, and then ultimately we had the main canal that would connect into the river. And at this point, uh, we, I thought our drainage system was amazing because uh, really had the least amount of impact in our surrounding communities uh, with as far as houses flooding the streets flooded but but you know as far as property damage it really wasn't that bad so and I'm gonna hand it over okay our third panelist is Evan Pratt Water Resources Commissioner for Washtenaw County Michigan well good morning everybody I'm really glad to be here with this panel uh, as it says, I'm the Water Resources Commissioner for Washtenaw County, Michigan. That's in the southeast part with Ann Arbor as our county seat. Population about 370,000. I'd just like to say I do this job because I love infrastructure. Uh, but like all of you out there, none of us really got trained in emergency response, right? That wasn't a program in the schools we had. And it's great to have uh, Rick here, who is actually teaching folks how to uh, manage this as part of their early career. Uh, I don't have as a major of a disaster, but we did have our biggest rainfall here recently in my county. So uh, first most rain that we've ever had in certain areas. But what I wanted to talk about just a little bit is just that a lot of times you'll see these numbers uh, or the rainfall frequencies or what's the 100 year storm. And the important part of this slide is just that it varies all over the place. And uh, if you're lucky, you don't get hammered. If you're unlucky, you get hammered hard and have 81 tornadoes apparently. So uh, we can't control this. We have to respond and react to it. And of course, resilience is a big piece of that. Uh, this slide just talks about uh, my agency primarily deals with stormwater, but we get a lot of calls from folks about flooding. Uh, we, we're patient, as Rick pointed out, I have a great team at the front office that answers the phones. Uh, most of those red dots are actually sewer backups. And we just talked to folks about indoor and outdoor flooding. Uh, indoor flooding, we see a lot of basement backups in our areas for a variety of reasons. Uh, but we certainly had a number of outdoor flooding areas. This slide shows the urbanized area of the city of Ann Arbor on the left, population of about 115,000, and the city of Ypsilanti on the right side, population about 22,000. Uh, this incident was about 400 uh, calls, about 230 basements uh, that needed some major cleaning uh, after the effect. Uh, minor, I would call it a minor emergency. It was a little bit of a creeper for us. Uh, it wasn't obvious to us the extent of issues that were going on uh, until there was a little bit of a conversation with folks. As we, as folks here understand, and probably any of you who've been through an emergency, things are pretty chaotic uh, when you have an event. And one thing to remember is sometimes you don't know everything that's going on. And it's really important, as you've maybe heard from some of the others, to really assess things and stay in touch with your staff 
Uh, here's some examples. I imagine many people have seen uh, situations like this on the left. The, the water pressure was so bad also from the outside of the home that not only did this, these folks get a sewer back up, but they also had part of their foundation collapse. So these types of stories are extremely painful. I say this was a much smaller event than any of the other ones you'll hear about, but each individual person, I guess I just have to say, uh, for all of you out there, if there's one thing you can remember in your career, if you think of every house like your grandma lives in it, you probably do a real good in this business uh, because we have to have empathy for the folks who experience this, whether it's a big event or a little one. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about resiliency. We have to understand what's coming to us in the future. On the bottom of this chart, this is not, by the way, a typical graph with time uh, on the bottom. This is just simply showing in my region uh, where rainfall is increasing, uh, what the amount of rainfall is for the one, 10, and 100 year frequencies are on the x-axis. So that blue band on the bottom, the center line is the actual number that's used, the 90%, 90th percentile, 90th confidence number that's used for these return frequencies. The important part is uh, the brown is showing us end of century predictions based on a, a mashup of six climate models where I could probably understand every 15th word in there and I could understand none of the equations, but I do understand that it's gonna be raining more for us. I know that's not true all across the country. The point is you have to have some idea of what's coming your way, whether it's droughts or the greater likelihood of fires. We can't prepare unless we have some idea of what's coming our way. Now I have no idea how this is gonna work out. The line is just sort of a, a median uh, not overly aggressive forecast. Uh, and I wanna just mention that some cities are actually taking into account that, that information already for their regions, not just the increased amount of rain, but what they're doing for resilience is as they do major infrastructure projects, they are looking to take into account the design life of either a renewal or a new installation and do some type of forecasting. Uh, we all know that most models uh, end up having limitations. They might be right about as often as a stopped clock, but they are excellent decision-making tools. And you wanna use that information in making your decisions. So these are the kinds of things that can happen in public works. It's super important for us to share with our elected officials, the folks who set our budgets, if it's a different group than the elected officials, what the consequences are if we don't prepare, if we don't do resilience uh, and we don't want to be those people standing out there saying, huh, and they had no idea that this might happen. Uh, I don't want to be that guy, that's for sure. I want to say, you know, we talked about this five years ago and either this was in the game plan or it wasn't. So I, I think the last thing, my regional uh, transportation planning agency, uh, they're called MPOs for folks who are in the transportation business, has done a long range forecast, that prior graph where I showed you end of century rainfall was used in this. Our state highway department used this. Uh, this is a map of flood risk rating uh, going forward in the future. And this is what we're seeing on the major roads and state trunk lines. This is a heat map of red, yellow, and green. I know that's hard to see because there's hardly any green on the map. So it's really important to understand when we had this event uh, here uh, back in uh, June of this year, uh, I mentioned that there was a lot of chaos. I was looking around in areas that had not been hit by a heavy cell. I spent about six hours driving around my county. I didn't see the worst of things. When I got home, my daughter showed me a TikTok of somebody with a jet ski on Interstate 94, which is the main commercial corridor between Detroit and Chicago. So uh, you never know where you're gonna get your information. Uh, one thing I might talk about a little bit later is you always wanna talk to your customer service staff and understand what kind of calls are coming in. With that, I'm gonna pop it right back to Jen. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, because who doesn't remember watching the winter storms come across Texas, is Brian Mason, Assistant Director of Public Works for the City of Houston, Texas. Thank you, Jen. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, once again, Brian Mason, Assistant Director and Emergency Management Coordinator uh, for Houston Public Works. Just a little bit of background uh, about my experience, 23 years of experience in emergency management, emergency response, homeland security, and environmental remediation. Uh, a quick snapshot on Houston. Um, Houston, we're the fourth largest city, fifth largest MSA metro area, um, 640 square miles. So when it comes to our incidents, we have a very large area that we have to serve uh, the citizens around the area. 
One thing we are proud of, we're the most racially and ethnically diverse U.S. metro metropolitan um, in the area. Uh, so for us, we have 90 consulates in our area. And when it comes to emergency messaging, uh, we have some challenges and we have to uh, send out messages in six different languages. English, Spanish, French, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Farsi. So communicating with our citizens um, can be a challenge at times during an event. We're also known as the Bayou City. We have lots of bayous or creeks that run through our city and Space City. We are proud of the Johnson Space Center down on the south side of Houston. Uh, we have the Texas Medical Center, which is the largest medical center in the world. Um, and then we have the busiest U.S. port as far as tonnage. So setting all that up with everybody is we have a lot of critical infrastructure that we have to support uh, during an incident to make sure uh, that the citizens are being served throughout the area. Our department's a very large department. Uh, not only do we do streets and bridges and drainage, but we also do uh, water, drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, uh, permitting for all of our uh, code compliance. Um, so we have a very large department that's very diverse and a lot of expertise and the items that we have to take care of on a daily basis and during an event. Some quick stats about the, uh, the area, 16,000 lane miles, which is a lot of lane miles we have to maintain. Good thing is we have 4,000 employees. Uh, we have a decent budget of $2.1 billion for an annual budget. Uh, so we're a fairly large department uh, that serves a very large city uh, down in southeast Texas. Houston and natural disasters, that's the same shot uh, from Hurricane Harvey. So the top is uh, prior to the, uh, the rain event. And then the bottom, you could see White Oak Bayou and I-45. Uh, that area basically came into a flooded river. Um, lots of cars were flooded out in that area. And then that same view was our winter storm in 2021. Um, I never thought living in Houston that I would use the term winter storm and snow and ice uh, like we did. Um, but that was definitely a challenge that we had to adapt to uh, when the weather came. I'm not sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but Houston does have a lot of experience when it comes to uh, FEMA disaster declarations. So in the last 40 years, we've had 26 disaster declarations. Of that, 22 of them are flood or storm related. So five hurricanes, five tropical storms, and then 12 additional rain events um, that cause you know, significant flooding across the area. Just to make things interesting, of course, we're all dealing with the pandemic the last 18 months, and then we had the winter storm in 2021. Our approach to uh, responses, um, you know, a lot of times the, the emergency management cycle, the media and a lot of folks tend to focus on the event and the response, and they'll focus some on the recovery, but a lot of people lose interest when it comes to the mitigation and preparedness. Uh, so us down in the Houston area, we've really tried to focus on the mitigation and preparedness to make the event and the response go as smooth as possibly can, as it possibly can. And to still a uh, quote from Ben Franklin, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. So we believe that down in Houston. Um, preparedness approach, once again, with the flooding, uh, just to kind of give you guys some idea about uh, the lay of the land down there. We have about 85,000 structures, or 13% of our total structures in the 100-year floodplain, uh, a little over 108,000 structures in the 500-year floodplain, or a total of 193,000, or almost 30% of all of our structures are in the 100-year and 500-year floodplain. Houston's a very flat area. We have a lot of bayous. Um, we get excessive rainfall rates, so we have a constant challenge when it comes to flooding. One of the mitigation things that we have implemented, and this is a credit to our political leaders, because um, it could have been very difficult to get past. So before 1981, none of us had a lot of the floodplain regulation or management. Uh, after 81, the current regulation was one foot above the 100-year floodplain. Well, in April of 2018, uh, not too long after Harvey, uh, we passed uh, a, a new requirement that now new construction is the 500-year floodplain plus two feet. Uh, so you can imagine some of our developers and, and some of the industry around wasn't super thrilled about that. Um, but our leadership had the vision and the discipline to realize that that was something critical to mitigate uh, the impact of flooding throughout the area. Our overarching uh, planning approach annually, we do our uh, update our COOP, our continuity of operations plan. So for us, we use our COOP kind of as an all hazards plan. Um, it identifies our essential functions. And then we have spinoffs of our COOP for our hurricane plan, our flooding plan, our active threat or active shooter plan, winter weather plans. Um, so we really focus on having a strong foundation 
um, with our coupe and our essential functions, and then that allows us to modify depending on the event. Of course, we do annual exercises with our after action reports. Um, you'll see there that I have lessons learned with a line through it. Um, we tend to use the terms lessons applied or lessons ignored. I'm sure a lot of us have worked through events or exercises where you have the same lessons learned over and over and over again, meaning that those lessons really weren't applied, they were more ignored. Um, on the right hand side is an example, uh, up in the upper, uh, the top right uh, was Hurricane Harvey, where when we were doing evacu evacuations of citizens in flooded areas in our dump trucks, we literally just crammed people in the back of the dump truck. They had to stand up, they had to sit down, they had to hold on to the rail. We knew that wasn't a safe way to do that. Um, so one of the lessons applied that we did, we fabricated benches to now we drop benches, tack weld them in place, provide ladders to allow people to get safely in and out of the vehicles. So that was one of our, just an example of a lessons applied from uh, one of our events. Um, one of the big things on preparedness that we like to focus on is really the relationship building. Um, I think the most benefit you get out of the planning process are the relationships you build during that planning process. Uh, the first time you, uh, you don't want the first time th that you're meeting somebody is to be one o'clock in the morning on the side of a road when you're working an event. Um, so we really focus on building the relationships with our fire police and our other first responder community. Um, incident response is a little bit more on the relationships. Uh, uh, for us, um, we have a great relationship with fire and police. Um, in the slides, we actually had uh, the police department came and served our guys barbecue at one of our maintenance yards. Um, you know, building that relationship, our guys and gals respond 24-7, 365 with fire and police. Um, on the right-hand side was the uh, George Floyd demonstrations that we had uh, last summer. And um, you know, our folks were down there securing the police station, the police headquarters, and really working close with fire and police during that event. And that was all due to our strong relationships that we had built during our uh, preparedness and during previous responses. Back to you, Jen. Okay, now for the fun part. I've used my superpowers to gather all of the burning questions that I know that you all have out there. So we'll get into our question and answer session. First question, I know from my own personal experience that there is so much that goes into resiliency, planning, disaster preparedness. Could you share with our audience one or two of the critical pieces, critical steps that all communities should really have in place? Rick, do you wanna start? Sure, I'll lead off. Well, in addition to developing an emergency response plan, which I think is something we're gonna talk about later, there's two really important things to put in place. One is to have a hazard mitigation plan. Look at your community, find out where your vulnerabilities are, and develop mitigation strategies for those so that you have a prioritized list of the things that you want to accomplish to make your community more resilient. The other piece is, is to make sure that your public work staff is trained so that they can operate within the NIMS uh, operating system. That's a national incident management system. Without that, you, you cannot uh, do a response where you interact with other first responders, such as police and fire and those outside of your community. Elliot? Uh, yeah, for, uh, for the city of Palm Bay, one of the things that we always did was every year it, around May, because uh, hurricane season starts June 1st, uh, around May, toward the end of May, we would have a hurricane expo. And during this expo, we would have, in, we would just invite all the vendors uh, that would do business with people that might have something to do with hurricanes. Uh, and then there were some other agencies that would attend, like the Red Cross, and we had our emergency management uh, office from, from our county. But the important thing, uh, we would also bring in a, a meteorologist, uh, the chief meteorologist that was from our local TV station, which actually drew in pretty good crowd. And then in our council chambers, we would do presentations. And during these presentations, people, uh, important you know, information that we could get out to the community, that's the type of information we would present. But Public Works always had a spot in this presentation. And part of the response here is, you know, the public outreach. People a lot of times don't really know what public works is or what our roles are. And especially during hurricane preparedness, 
there's a big role for her for public works department. So that was our opportunity to talk to the uh, citizens that attended that meeting, and we would just really first give them the basic knowledge of what public works is, just get them thinking about the types of services that we provide for them that they never even knew we existed until there was a problem. And then we would share uh, how we uh, prepare for the hurricanes and how we actually do uh, work for them during events and and even afterwards and our motto of you know the public works motto of we the first in and and last to leave and in, in Palm Bay we adopted the well we actually never leave because it's really true we we're always there and we we never leave the events we're always uh, at the events or even just always there for our community well I'm gonna tackle just a little bit. I'm going to zoom right down because I know there's a wide variety of experiences out there in our audience today and I'm just going to go to kind of the hands-on level. Uh, I talked about uh, preparedness and mitigation kind of like Brian did, showed that slide with all the wet roads. So our focus because I'm a stormwater agency is reducing the frequency and severity of flooding. Three things that we've been doing for the past decade or so to deal with that is number one, uh, gave a presentation yesterday with my deputy Scott on seven years of data that we have from requiring infiltration for all new developments. We're trying to soak more water into the ground and we've built a lot of resiliency into those calculations. The flooding event that I mentioned earlier, uh, none of those 250 plus new developments over the last seven years experienced the type of flooding that other people did, or at least we did not get calls from those folks. Uh, secondly, uh, we've also been working on retrofitting some regional stormwater basins. Uh, these are not ones that can handle a hundred year flood, but we found through a partnership and relationships with the University of Michigan, as well as the consulting community, that some remote sensing and controls have allowed us to double the capacity simply by adjusting the timing of some of our regional uh, basins out there. And then the third thing we've done, of course, is uh, Again, with partnerships, we've tried to mobilize and educate the public. Uh, my predecessor started a program of training master rain gardeners. We have over a thousand rain gardens just in the metro Ann Arbor area. These can handle a couple million gallons of water every year. That's nice. Uh, it doesn't. It, it doesn't put a huge dent in our bucket, if you will, although we don't get the kind of rain the rest of these folks do, it seems. Uh, what it does do is it gives us a volunteer cadre of 400 folks to help us with O&M. My budget's only $4 million, Brian, so <laughs> I'll pass it along to you for the next, uh, next comment. Uh, for, for us in, in the Houston area, I, I think our biggest um, asset, and you're going to hear me say this over and over and over again, um, is going to be relationships, relationships, relationships. So as we're doing planning, whether it's mitigation planning or whether it's response planning, uh, it's really knowing who your SMEs are, your subject matter experts, and it's not always the you know, professional engineer or the professional geologists, a lot of times it's the frontline field folks. They have a lot of firsthand experience of being out in the field. They see how things work. They know what their equipment can and cannot do. They know the challenges that they're able to see firsthand during an event. So we really rely on bringing in our frontline employees, gathering information from them, getting their input and trying to incorporate all that into our planning process. Great. Next question is, is preparation for not only the expected, but the unexpected. Um, you know, in Iowa, we prepared for floods. We prepared for them every year. We ran scenarios. Derechos, we did not. So uh, what advice do you have uh, for our audience in how to prepare for not only the expected, but also the unexpected? Uh, so, so for us, I mentioned it earlier, we really rely on our COOP, our continuity of operations plan. It, it clearly defines our essential functions, um, you know, purify and distribute potable water, collect and treat wastewater, maintain streets and roads and bridges and the drainage system. And so for us, um, we always defer to those. So the winter storm for us was a prime example. We initially thought that was going to be a road and ice and snow issue. And real quickly, it turned into a boil water notice potable water challenge. And that is one of our top priorities. So as a department, we are able to shift a lot of our resources from other service lines or divisions to support our water group um, to help address their issues and the challenges that they had. So our thing is we try to make sure we have a strong foundation. Um, and actually our, our uh, theme or our motto for our department is we create a strong foundation for Houston to thrive. 
and we really embrace that. So we, we fall back on our foundation items, our key items, and whatever's thrown our way, we just adapt trying to fulfill those essential functions. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so as I mentioned, I work for a smaller agency. We've got about 720 miles of stormwater infrastructure, a few dams across a 910 square mile county. I've got about a dozen people that are in the stormwater side of things. I mentioned the $4 million budget. My main focus was having an emergency response plan. Our department never had one. And really it's only been about two and a half years since my field manager uh, did a little online work, found some examples from the Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, and other uh, folks uh, in our county who had response plans. I just didn't want to be that guy on TV throwing his hands up in the air and saying, well, you know, obviously it's rained so much, you couldn't expect us to handle this in whatever words folks used. I wanted to be the guy who said, well, we're doing this, we're doing that, everybody's out there, all the trucks are moving, we've only got so many pumps, uh, we're out there, we're going to get you back in shape as quick as we can, but obviously it's a, it's a pretty tough situation out there, let us know if you need a hand. And having an emergency response plan makes it a lot easier to quickly tick that stuff off. Yeah. Well, speaking of emergency response plans, you know, we often hear that these emergency response plans are very critical to um, building, to becoming a more resilient community, to, to being prepared. Uh, what advice do you have for, you know, did you in these events, did you have emergency response plans? Did you use them? Um, any recommendations on, for communities on, on how they should be used, if, when? Sure, I'll, I'll jump into that and I'll kind of tie it back to the last question is, you know, how do you write an emergency response plan for the unexpected? And, you know, good emergency response plans aren't necessarily scripts to specific events. Mm -hmm. They are scripts to all sorts of subsets, that be it uh, evacuation, debris management, urban search and rescue. And you'll have a list of 20 or so, 20 or more of those things and when you have an emergency, whatever it is, you go to that list and it's like going to the grocery store and you pick the things that you need to respond to this specific disaster and then you can implement those. So it, it's key to have a, a plan who's, that's built in that way. I don't think I can add much to what Rick just said. I don't want you about Ryan. I, I just ditto, but I'll add one other thing. Um, we tend to, we don't call our plans uh, uh, standard operating procedures, we call them more guides. So as Rick mentioned, you know, kind of think of it as the football coach has, you know, the 50 plays on their cheat sheet on the side and they can pick whatever play they want. Um, that way we don't pigeonhole our decision makers that you must do step one through step 10 in a certain order. So we do more of a guide of here are the 10, 12, 15 things we probably should do. But depending on the event, I may go skip from number one to number nine because I don't need to do two through eight for that type of event. So I think your plan needs to be flexible um, and definitely, and I mentioned it earlier, get the input from the frontline folks that are having to execute that plan. If we're expecting them to cash that check that we write, they need to have input into you know, making sure there's sufficient funds in that account when it's time to, to cash that check. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about lessons learned or uh, I like Brian's terminology of lessons applied and lessons ignored. We all have those lessons that we have ignored. Um, anyone who's been through a disaster knows that even the best laid plans will, will have some holes, will have some things that we wish we would have done, known or have done differently. Uh, what advice do you have for our audience today on some of the, the lessons that you have learned in your experiences? I could take that. Uh, for I like the lessons applied. I think that's a really good way of saying it because there are those that are, they do get ignored and those that do get applied. And for uh, Palm Bay, when I, when we had those Mother's Day fires, you know, come come comes back to what Brian said with the relationships. We had really good relationships with our police and fire department. So uh, when it came time to seeing what can we do differently if we ever had fires in in our community again what would we do differently? We put our people at risk by getting them close to these fires just to cut the line to get the fire trucks in there. And here the fire trucks uh, and the firemen had their gear, but our guys didn't. And they were pretty exposed being in a front end loader trying to uh, get these lines cut so that, the, so that the fire trucks could get in there. So one of the things that we did uh, was we implemented getting uh, fire gear for our key staff and uh, really that was a big help from our fire department and again it comes back to that relationship that we had with them 
they were able to help us get that, and we got the funding for, for our crews to get some fire gear for our crews. And another thing, from the private side, uh, we had Hurricane Matthew that took place, I think it was in 2017, and that was something, Consor was the consultant for the Florida Department of Transportation, and I worked in the central Florida area, so I responded to that event and worked uh, tirelessly on that event, but uh, part of uh, the contractor, or the contract that we had with the state the contractor was supposed to be doing the leaners and hangers. And for those of you that don't know what that is, it's basically the trees that are leaning that cause a hazard or the branches that are hanging that cause a hazard. So part of their contract was a separate line item in their contract and they were supposed to cut these down. Well, in the process of it, they started doing more of the heavy maintenance because they saw that that was a big ticket item that they could possibly get. And we had to stop them in operations. We had to stop their operation completely and regroup and we ended up going through and actually marking the trees that needed to be cut and marking the branches that needed to be cut so that they were actually cutting the hazards and not just doing this heavy maintenance that they wanted to do and then they were trying to be a little bit sneaky because part of that line item it did include actually getting rid of the debris uh, as part of that line item but they were bringing the tree limbs into the debris management sites and then trying to mix it in with the debris that was at the debris management site. So essentially they would kind of get paid a second time for it. And uh, so we had to, of course, cut, the, cut that operation uh, down. And uh, we made, a, made it a point to actually mark the limbs when they were on the ground with a lot of spray paint so that it was very clear that they were the trees or limbs that were cut because they were a hazard and not the debris that was just from the general debris from the from the event. Yeah. You know, I'm going to say, uh, you know, I'll say it was a lesson applied. It was just something I learned from my team. Uh, you know, again, the team, the team, the team uh, is the way we say it up our way anyways. <laughs> is uh, That's a Bo <laughs> Schembechler thing. Sorry to Sorry. anybody who's not into that. Um, but communications, right, we all know is important. Anytime you survey your, your constituency or your employees, or you do strategic planning, one of the top two or three things is always, boy, we wish communications was better. I didn't realize how useful our work order soft management software was going to be in communicating quick bullets within a day of our event to just let elected officials and other key stakeholders know Here's the status report of what we know. It's very chaotic when there's an event. Again, I, I've not had events as chaotic as what these folks have had, but whatever the event is, right, is the most chaotic thing that, uh, that your officials are experiencing and that people have experienced. So it was fantastic to be able to do that and, and then within a week be able to produce a really nice map. You know, I showed you a, an excerpt from it uh, of giving people the ability to visually see what's going on. So that communications piece. And I think the, the third learning out of that, because I basically had gone to my staff and said, I, I need to have a list and I need to have a map. And they immediately knew that it was the work order software where we're gonna get that. But I also realized I probably should have gone and talked to my customer service staff just a little sooner. How's it going with the phones? As I mentioned, I've got a small team, so maybe that's not uh, the, the, I'm an elected official as well. Maybe that's not the, the boss's job in every organization, but somebody needs to take the pulse of the folks who are answering the phone because they answer the phone every day and they know what is a 10X event or a 100X event or twice as bad as usual. And they'll tell you, they have that experience. And then uh, just one thing to add. So uh, for us, I, I'd, I'd recommend whenever you identify challenges and you're identifying the things you're going to implement to fix them, uh, keep them reasonable. Uh, so for us, for example, Hurricane Harvey, no, nobody thought when we saw the weather reports of 40 plus inches of rain, you laugh when you hear that from the weatherman. You're like, there's no way that's going to, we're not going to get almost four feet of rain. <coughs> well, it happened. And uh, when we were doing the high water rescue, that was not something that we had done before. So we sent you know, our, our men and women out there driving in three, four, five feet of water in dump trucks trying to rescue people. Um, some of our real lessons from that um, was, you know, ideally we wish we could have bought a whole new fleet of high water vehicles with the high you know, in, intake, and, but we didn't have the budget or the funding to do that. But there was other things we could do. We got uh, a lot of our drivers um, swimming lessons. You know, we didn't realize there were a lot of our folks that were doing high water rescue that did not know how to swim, how to do life safety swimming. 
Um, so we got you know some training, some swimming lessons. We fabricated benches. There were easy, low-hanging items that we could get and implement and make that a lesson applied. And some of the big ones, sometimes you just have budget constraints. And so my, my recommendation is keep them realistic. Um, you may have a longer plan or project that you want to work something over three to five years through a budget cycle, but what are the small wins you can get quickly and start to implement to make a difference the next week or the next month following an event? Sure, yeah. Now I'd like to talk just briefly, you know, how do you get at these lessons learned? You know, some of them are self-evident, but there's a lot of other lessons that are not necessarily self-evident, so there's a process to get at that, and that's called an after-action review. And you simply get your people together and you ask them basic questions. What was expected to happen? What actually happened? And why? And that's got to be done in a safe environment without placing blame on anybody. And that can reveal all sorts of additional lessons that you had not, uh, were not evident to you earlier. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Rick. I'd like to follow up on that a little bit. Um, and how do we take those after action views and sort of rise that up the chain, if, you'll, if, if you may, um, to make sure that our local leaders and our other departments are on the same page? So have you been involved in some of those post-incident uh, debriefs and you know, have you been able to use them to build relationships within other departments and also to make sure, again, that as a, uh, as a community, everybody's kind of working towards the same goals? I'll take a quick start on that one. I've got a debrief with my Board of County Commissioners coming up in about two weeks. Uh, I've been calling them individually to just get a sense of what, what in their mind needs to be the topic of discussion. I just want everybody to walk out of the room having experienced the same event. I know from individual conversations during the event that not everyone had the same experience and that's not a good foundation to be on but I'll, I'll let the smarter people talk a little more about it <laughs> I, I could take a second there uh, with really for the city of Palm Bay we had our public information officer that was just amazing and getting the information out to the public was really good too from her standpoint she used to work for a news uh, news uh, station so she kind of already had that experience of working with the media and uh, we always took a proactive ap approach and that was probably one of the best things we could have done because instead of the media coming to us we were always going to them with the information and I think that really stopped a lot of the potential issues that might come from the attacks that might come from the media because we were being proactive and going to them. And that was really instrumental uh, as far as Tropical Storm Fay because I was the one basically in charge of that event since that was a big public works event. Uh, you know, I was just giving my briefings to our city manager and to our public information officer and then they were taking that information and bringing it out to the public. So uh, really that relationship, I mean, I think we, we've kind of honed in on that, that relationships are super important and we really need to make sure that we are maintaining those relationships or, or starting those relationships and, and really uh, getting them to our benefit because like our news PIO, I mean, she had the relationships with the news media, so that really made a big difference for the way that our city communicated with the public. Yeah. Well, your questions, uh, your, your responses just keep leading me to, to more and more questions, as I'm sure, it does, I'm sure it's doing for all of you. Uh, we talk about communication, and you know, in these events, communication is so important, but it's such a broad topic. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, you mentioned the media, in my experience, I found that oftentimes in these events, um, initially, you know, during the, as the chaos starts to subside, we can see as we move from that initial response into recovery, oftentimes the scrutiny can increase. The scrutiny from the public, certainly the scrutiny from the media. Um, Elia, you mentioned the media specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, can, what advice do you have for our audience? In you know, I have seen even the best public works professionals or other departments. Um, during that event, really handle that event well, but then struggle when you get into this recovery mode. Uh, what can you share with our audience and your experience in that? Yeah. I would say definitely rely on your public information people. And if you are the public works director that's going to be the one expected to speak in front of the media, I would highly suggest that you take some trainings with uh, media courses. Uh, we had our, actually our public information officer used to do trainings internally so that the directors would have that 
extra training to be able to talk to the media because there is a special skill that, that comes with that. Uh, so I would definitely recommend that if you were in that, in that position where you would have to talk to the media that you maybe get some training because it would be valuable for you to have that. But, but again, it comes back to those relationships and, and just learning you know, what, what's out there. I know Brian's got something really important to say on this. I just want to chime in a big plug for what I love about APWA is our Michigan Public Service Institute. Every two years, we have a very aggressive reporter who's known in the state of Michigan for being very aggressive, and he comes in and gives people the business, I got to say, but it's an excellent learning experience. Brian, I know you got some really good thoughts on this. Uh, for, for us, when it comes to the public communication, so um, as Rick mentioned earlier, we follow NIMS, ICS when events happen. So we create a JIC, the Joint Information Center, um, during an event, during the incident, the response, and then through the recovery portion. Um, and we have all the stakeholders in there, fire, police, public works, health department, um, depending on what the event is. And uh, we really make sure we have unified messaging and talking points. Um, nobody contradicts anybody. Um, and then I think kind of a, a piece of advice we were talking about earlier, um, you know, keep in mind we are all, most of us are government servants or employees. Uh, so a lot of our information can be, uh, you know, Freedom of Information Act or TPIA requested. Uh, so, you know, not that we're trying to hide anything, but you know, if you tend to have sensitive conversations, it may not be the best thing to put it in an email because um, that's the type of thing that could be FOIA later down the line. Um, and even during the winter storm, we joke around, me and uh, one of our other folks here, uh, we are joking around that I still have about 1,200 unread emails from the winter storm because everyone's just firing off emails and you're so busy, you're like, I don't have time to do that. Call me if you need me. So we did a lot more in person. Um, and of course, all of our stuff just went through the JIC, which makes it very nice for people like me that if they ask for something, I'll go, you can talk to the uh, Joint Information Center over there, please. I'm not the one to give you that answer. Right. Yes, for sure. Those 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 uh, public information officers are invaluable. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'll add just two quick things. Uh, one is is that that uh, in difficult situations, it's good to do proactive press releases so that you're getting the same information out to all the all the different media sources. The other thing is is that when I prepare to meet with the media, I prepare a, a some notes and got all my facts and figures in there. And I share that with the reporters before the, the interview starts. And that's really important, especially when you, when you have numbers and you want to make sure that you're quoted correctly on that. And that the, I got to tell you, the, the reporters really appreciate having that information in their hand. Yeah. That's a good point. Well, I'll combine a, a lesson learned and a media story. Um, in our community, when the derecho came through, we had made the decision not to do press conferences. Uh, 350,000 people were without power, power lines were down, cable lines were down. We would really be giving a press conference to no one because there was nobody impacted that would be able to watch it. And um, we underwent tremendous scrutiny for that. And that was definitely a lesson learned that, you know, even if you can get that information out to a few people, it is definitely worth your time. Um, let's talk a little bit about public works as first responders. We talk a lot about mm -hmm. Uh, public Works as First Responders. I love the campaign APWA has done to really get that message out there. All of us who have been involved in these events know that Public Works are oftentimes the very first responders. Um, in the derecho, uh, you know, we brought our snow plows out to clear the streets because the public safety, the police and fire couldn't get anywhere until we had done that. So. Um, have you have you done these campaigns in your communities? How have you worked to sort of build those relationships and make it known that you know we really are first responders? I could take that. I know uh, when I was at the city of Palm Bay and I became the public works director, one of my biggest goals was to set public outreach. I just wanted people to really know who Public Works was and what we did in their community because as that first responder, I mean, we are that first to come in, the first, the last to leave, and really we never leave. So uh, coming into that uh, mindset and then also just knowing what our services were, we wanted to make sure our community knew that. So we created a video that's actually, it's, it's on YouTube if you, uh, if you search Palm Bay, it's our job. Uh, you'll find that video, but it really is a good, good tool that we use to to reach out to our community and and a way to share the message. Uh, I shared that video with all my family and friends, and 
my brother, he knew I was an engineer. He knew that I worked for a city, but he had no clue what I did. And just sharing that video really made a difference just for him and getting that perspective of what, of what I even did or what Public Works did. And Public Works has such a big key role that people just don't understand until something goes wrong. And in that video, we actually show what a day in, in the life would be like if we didn't have public work. So again, it's just that public outreach. We all have friends, we all have family that we can talk to about what public works is and getting that message out because we are the first responders. We should be right there in line with the police and the fire and, and that should be a partnership. And, and it comes back to those relationships as well with those types of departments. You really wanna have those relationships because you wanna be recognized as that first responder. Uh, yeah. So, shameless plug, first off, uh, at 9.45, I'm doing a uh, presentation on uh, Public Works, the other first responder, room 232, so please, uh, please attend. Um, but, but for us in Houston, and, and you'll see in my presentation, um, you know, we have clips from the mayor, uh, assistant uh, police chief, uh, the fire chief. We really are viewed as a first responder in our community. Um, when it came to COVID and getting the vaccine, our employees were some of the very first ones in December to start to get the vaccine uh, because we truly are viewed as a first responder. Um, they know without us maintaining streets, they can't get to their scene. They know if we're not maintaining water pressure, they can't fight fires. Um, there's all those things that we do that they take for granted to fulfill their mission and they really value our partnership and, and we really are a tight-knit family down there, a first responder family where we really look out for each other um, during events and incidents. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay, final question, lightning round. What is the one takeaway that you would like to leave our audience with today? Brian, we'll start with you. Well, I guess maybe it's kind of two things. Uh, f first thing, uh, we mentioned all of us have relationships, relationships, relationships. Um, that's going to be your key to having a successful event or response. And then I think when you're going through the planning process, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. You're never going to have a perfect plan. They're always going to be evergreen. They're always going to be changing. So best bet, get something down on paper, exercise it, use it, and then improve it um, as incidents and exercises pop up. Yeah, I gotta echo the relationships as a small organization. Any of those things I mentioned are, are all partnerships. There just isn't time to mention the partners and give all the credit that's due. Uh, but then the second thing I'll echo, you've already heard before, is you wanna be on the front foot with your communications. You wanna share your communications before you communicate them, you know, just like Rick said. So that, that's the number one thing. In a chaotic situation, really the communications are the only thing you can control. Yeah, and for me, the relationships, again, I know that we've talked about a lot about that, but that makes such a huge difference. And really, if you're thinking about having these relationships with your police and fire, maybe it's not such a good relationship currently. Uh, you know, sometimes you just need to take your ego, put that ego aside, pat them on the back a little bit. They like to get, uh, you know, praised for things. And, and I know we don't do that enough for ourselves. And, and that might be part of the reason why people don't know what Public Works is. But, but uh, to get their support, sometimes you need to speak their language. And sometimes you need to just, uh, you know, get in there, you know, take them out to lunch or go, you know, have dinner together before a council meeting or a commission meeting and start developing that relationship because it will really make such a huge difference. And I think you've heard from all of us here today that that relationship with the police and the fire department is crucial. You know, our way out of this is to design our way out of this. That, you know, from here forward, we need to consider resilience in the design of all of our projects. And in fact, it's a part of the ASE code of ethics now. So we're ethically obligated to consider resilience in all of our designs. And with that, I, I want to point out there's two parts to designing for resilience. There's designing to withstand shocks and then also quick recovery. And the, the quick recovery is there because regardless of what level we choose to design for that shock that we're going to withstand, someday that level is going to be exceeded. And then it's all about quick recovery. And that's the easy part of the design to overlook. And it, it involves a whole different design strategy. So the thing I want to leave you with is don't forget the design for quick recovery. Right. Well, thank you to all of our panelists today. Evan, Elia, Rick, and Brian. I hope all of you heard something in this discussion to take back to your communities today. 
to continue to build resilience in our communities. I know for myself, I couldn't have done any of the response of these disasters without the help of my other, with my other public works partners. We really are stronger together. Thank you. Aaron, I'll turn it back to you. You bet. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being with us here today. Be sure not to miss today's expo, closing at 3 p.m. From the PWX Broadcast Studio here in St. Louis, be stronger together.